Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Liberty Global's fourth quarter 2019 investor call. This call and the associated webcasts are the property of Liberty Global, and any redistribution, retransmission, or rebroadcast of the call or webcast in any form without the express written consent of Liberty Global is strictly prohibited. At this time, all, t all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's formal presentation materials can be found under the Investor Relations section of Liberty Global's website at libertyglobal.com. After today's formal presentation, instructions will be given for a question and answer session. Page two of the slides details the company's safe arbor statement regarding forward-looking statements. Today's presentation may include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, including the company's expectations with respect to its outlook and future growth prospects and other information and statements that are not historical fact. These forward-looking statements involve certain risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by these statements. These risks include those detailed in Liberty Global's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including its most recent filed forms 10-Q and 10-K as amended. Liberty Global disclaims any obligation to update any of these forward-looking statements to reflect any change in its expectations or its conditions on which any such statement is based. I would now like to turn the call over to Ms. Mr. Mike Fries. Thanks, operator, and welcome, everyone. Uh, good to be back online with you. We have a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to kick it right off with some highlights. Uh, then, Charlie, we hit the numbers, and we'll get to your questions for the balance of the hour. I'm on slide four, uh, which is a good snapshot of the year. I'm just going to say up front that there are a handful of important storylines here, so bear with me. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this page, uh, and I'll start with the fact uh, that we met or exceeded all of our guidance targets for 2019. Uh, you would know that revenue was largely flat year over year. Uh, we had positive customer ROPRU growth. That was offset by a small customer loss of 74000 A rebased operating cash flow of $4.9 billion was down 3% year over year. That's essentially what we forecasted, and by the way, it was right on budget for us. And we wide, widely reported the reasons for that, right? namely the turnaround in Switzerland and the headwinds in the UK, which we'll talk a lot about today. And then finally, we had better than budgeted capital efficiency, which helped deliver $770 million of free cash flow, exceeding our guidance, uh, and that's a number that's up nearly 100% year over year. Now, as we've discussed for some time, just to put these numbers into context, Europe is a more mature market today than it was 5, 10, or 20 years ago. Broadband growth is slowing. That's inevitable. And the video business, while much healthier than the U.S., uh, is flattening out in most countries. So having said that, though, the opportunity to drive sustainable growth and healthy free cash flow is as real as it ever was. And to achieve that, our operating strategy is clear. Number one, we're investing in gigabit broadband speeds across our footprint, usually well ahead of the fiber guys. Um, two, we're digitizing the customer experience to improve costs and churn. This takes some upfront investment but works everywhere we do it. Three, we're prioritizing profitable video subscriber growth, which makes total sense as we roll out advanced set-tops, integrate apps, and support the bundle. And four, we're committed to driving fixed mobile convergence. There is no debate here. A fixed mobile convergence delivers significant synergies and a winning customer strategy that improves churn and NPS and grows market share over time. Now, by the way, uh, some of you were wondering if we would ever be able to resize and rescale our operating model after the Vodafone deal and the sale of Austria. And the answer is yes. Uh, you'll notice that total central costs were reduced by $170 million or 16% in 2019, with continued reductions coming in 2020, and Charlie will dig into those numbers. We also announced a partnership with Infosys to deliver the services required to our TSA partners like Vodafone and to ensure that the revenue and costs completely align on those contracts over the next four to five years. So hopefully we put that issue to bed. <laughs> Now, continuing on this slide, last year was pretty transformational for us on the strategic front with the sale of four markets to Vodafone for $21 billion. This transaction, perhaps more than anything, highlighted the disconnect between public and private market values in Europe. The price to Vodafone, which by all accounts they were and remain thrilled with, uh, was around 11 times operating cash flow or EBITDA all-in, which is twice where our current trading multiple seems to be. The deal also validated the power of fixed mobile convergence mergers uh, with reported synergies to them, I think around 7.5 billion euros on an MPV basis. And it left us with significant liquidity, right, which now sits at $11 billion, including $8 billion of cash. 
Now, of course, we used a large proportion of those proceeds on capital returns to shareholders. Uh, we bought back a record amount of stock last year, repurchasing $3.2 billion of our equity, or approximately 16% of the company. $2.7 billion of that was through the Dutch auction tender that we completed in September at $27 per share. And to show our continued commitment, uh, we're announcing today another $1 billion buyback authorization. That number might seem small to some of you, but if you go back over the last 10 years, uh, this number is consistent with our buyback programs of the past. Uh, usually the quantum of our buyback authorizations generally represents around 5 to 10% of our market cap and around 75% to 125% of our projected free cash flow. In this case, we're right down the middle with 8% of our market cap and 100% of our free cash flow guidance, which is a billion dollars for 2020. And then the final storyline here is that we're in a great position to continue crystallizing value in our core markets. I won't run through each country and I'm not gonna talk about real or hypothetical discussions, but the strategies that we might be pursuing are completely consistent with what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Fixed mobile convergence works, and fixed mobile combinations are materially accretive operationally and financially to our core cable platforms. You should assume we're always examining those options. And that's because our fixed networks are extremely valuable. There will be one gig everywhere many years before the incumbents. And with, the, with that expansion comes opportunities to finance, capitalize, and resell our infrastructure. You should assume we're examining those sorts of options as well. And then lastly, as we demonstrated in 2019, our operations are highly cash generative and already delivering substantial free cash flow, which, as our guidance for uh, 2020 indicates, will continue to grow significantly both on an absolute basis and a levered free cash flow per share basis as we continue to shrink our equity. Now, that was a mouthful, I realize, and I'm happy to take questions on any or all of it. Uh, but since the UK is our largest market, uh, let me spend a couple minutes on Virgin Media, and I'm on slide five now. Now, consistent with the European theme I just outlined, the last 18 months have been a bit tougher in the UK as a result of three key challenges. First, the broadband business has become more competitive and promotional with the entire market slowing down. Now we're still adding broadband subs and holding share, primarily because we're investing in gigabit speed and network expansion, but price competition at the low end of the market has been aggressive. <laughs> Second, the video market is also flattening. Sky has lost millions of satellite subs, a portion of which they've converted to Now TV. Uh, we've done much better than our peers, but we're still losing video RGUs as we focus on higher end customers. And third, the impact of external headwinds has been significant. In the last three years, we've incurred over 200 million pounds in increased costs associated with broadband tax increases, inflationary programming contracts, mobile regulation changes, and other factors. And despite these challenges, as our fourth quarter results demonstrate, we are more than holding our own in this market. We deliver the highest revenue and the highest customer ARPU growth in Q4 at around 1.5% each. We had a record year for mobile postpaid sub ads. And CapEx discipline drove operating free cash flow up 26% for the full year. And that's including the cost of bundling uh, out over a, building out over a half million new premises through Project Lightning. Just to reiterate, because I know it's on everyone's mind, Lightning continues to be a smart use of Virgin's free cash flow. We've now built over 2 million homes and we're serving over 450,000 new customers who generated 240 million pounds of revenue and 120 million pounds of OCF. And just as importantly, penetration rates and ARPUs are still tracking, and the cost per premise declined 20% last year, which helped solidify our capital returns. Now, the bigger question on your minds is the strategy moving forward for Virgin Media, I imagine. And the short answer is, we're confident that Virgin has a sound operating plan that will retain and grow customers, drive modest revenue and operating cash flow growth, and deliver significant and sustainable free cash flow over the medium term. And that's the base case. So excluding any strategic transactions we might consider in the market. Now we say medium term, because uh, as we foreshadow, 2020 will be another year of unavoidable headwinds. I'm referring of course to Ofcom's out of contract notification requirements, another increase in our annual broadband taxes, and contractual programming cost increases, all of which will total about 100 million pounds in negative operating cash flow this year. Now, Lutz has his work cut out for him, but in my opinion, he's doing all the right things. First of all, he's revitalizing the talent and leadership at Virgin. The addition of Severina Pascu, who transferred from Switzerland to the UK as CFO and Deputy CEO, is a great move for us. Uh, they're going to make an outstanding team, in my view. Secondly, he's focused on the right organic growth drivers. 
get the network to one gig everywhere and well ahead of the competition, uh, who are all busy making promises while we're delivering. This is a huge strategic and political advantage for Virgin, by the way. Continue pushing our fixed mobile leadership uh, and preparing for a switch over to the Vodafone MVNO, which provides access to 5G and much better pricing. And invest in the customer experience through digital initiatives that will create better customer journeys at lower cost. All those things are working and will work. And then obviously we continue to explore strategic options in the market. For example, there is a clear opportunity to scale up our network and potentially look at other infrastructure related moves that create value. And by the way, everything we're doing today with Lightning is self-funded out of Virgin Free Cash Flow. And if we were to look at expanding to an additional seven to 10 million homes, we would almost assuredly seek to do so off balance sheet and with third party partners or financing sources. I hope that's clear to folks. Now let me switch to a couple of other markets quickly here on slide seven. Uh, and the folks have asked us in the past, why would Vodafone or Deutsche Telekom pay us 11 to 12 times EBITDA for our cable assets? Or why would we acquire mobile assets in Belgium or Holland, admittedly at lower multiples, but why would we do it? And I think perhaps the best way to answer that question is to look at the JV in Holland with Vodafone, which after just a couple of years has achieved everything we hoped it would and is in the process uh, of becoming and has become the undisputed market leader in, in Holland. 2019 was a breakthrough year for Vodafone Ziggo. They hit or exceeded all of their guidance targets, which included modest declines in fixed RGUs, but considerable market share gain from KPN. It was a similar story in mobile with Vodafone Ziggo adding 269,000 postpaid subs and the incumbent going backwards. That helped drive revenue and EBITDA up 1% and 4% respectively last year, so they're back to growth in this market. And the JV delivered 470 million euros of levered free cash flow. So put a market yield on that, and you'll arrive at a pretty meaningful equity value uh, for both partners. How have they done that? Well, they followed the same playbook that has underscored all fixed mobile mergers in Europe. They've already hit 85% of the publicly disclosed synergy target of 210 million euros. They prioritize product innovation, including nationwide gigabit speeds, the launch of next-gen set-top boxes, uh, product simplification. I mean, they took uh, bundles from 42,000 to 300 and a great uh, set of content arrangements like Zigo Sports and HBO. And through convergence, they become the number one fixed broadband provider in Holland with seven out of 10 homes taking at least one product from a uh, Vodafone Ziggo. So simply put, the strategy worked. Now, finally, a short update on UPC Switzerland, uh, where the business is clearly turning around. And why do we say that? Well, we hit all of our internal targets for 2019, including a 40% improvement in fixed customer loss, a 40% improvement in RGU loss, and revenue and cash flow results right on plan. Even in this heavy investment period, UPC Switzerland generated $300 million of operating free cash flow and significant free cash flow or levered free cash flow. There have been four consistent drivers to our success, and this is going to start to sound repetitive because it's the same strategy we're deploying in all of our markets, uh, beginning with a nationwide one gig launch which already reaches 75% of Swiss homes, well ahead of Swisscom and Sunrise. Uh, we've transformed the TV proposition with advanced TV boxes rolled out to 60% of our sub base now. Uh, and like UK and Holland and Belgium, a fixed mobile convergence is taking hold with a 70% improvement in mobile subscriber ads last year and a doubling of the MPS. And then finally, our investment in digital across the organization and including customer interactions is working. We've had the highest MPS since we began measuring it 11 years ago. So at this stage, we're happy to own this business. Switzerland is a strong and rational market with a stable economy and good political support for our initiatives. I just met with the president of Switzerland, and she was thrilled that we're still there to drive innovation. On top of that, we're delivering 50% operating cash flow margins and significant and growing free cash flow from this point forward. So I guess if Swisscom and Sunrise can trade at high single-digit multiples of EBITDA, and mid-single-digit levered uh, free cash flow yields uh, with results similar or not even as good as ours, there's tremendous value to be created with, with this business on our own. So to wrap up my remarks, uh, for the balance of 2020, we're focused first and foremost on navigating the headwinds in the UK market and delivering steady and growing free cash flow. A Virgin is a strong brand with the best network, the fastest broadband speeds, all of the key content, and a robust fixed mobile strategy. Uh, these are powerful drivers for operating success, and I believe in this team. They're going to get it done. And just as importantly, and as you would expect, we're exploring strategic opportunities in the U.K. and all of our core markets to create meaningful value today and over the long term. So three drivers, 
sustainable and growing levered free cash flow, real strategic opportunities to close the value gap in our core markets, and $11 billion of liquidity to fuel this narrative. Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Mike. And I'm now on the page titled Group Overview. Mike's already given detail on the results of our key markets and the annual figures, so I'm going to focus on the key financials for Q4. Group revenue declined in Q4 0.5%, and OCF declined 4.1%. Both figures were broadly similar to the Q3 figures. The reduction in CapEx in Q4 to 28.2% of sales versus 32.9% last year continued the 2019 trend of lower capital intensity and resulted in a Q4 OFCF of $433 million. Liquidity remains very strong, with $8.1 billion of cash and revolver credit facilities of $3 billion. Since year-end, we've been very proactive on the refinancing front, and we now sit with a fixed cost of 4% for our interest and an average maturity on our debt of approximately 7.4 years. Total consolidated debt was $26.3 billion, which resulted in a consolidated debt-to-OCF ratio of 5.4 times gross and 3.7 times net. Now, you should note we've changed our targeted four to five times debt-to-OCF leverage definition from an LQA, last quarter annualized, to an LTM, last 12 months OCF basis, as we believe an LTM approach is more appropriate metric for our portfolio of maturing assets. Now, in Q4, the LQA numbers would have been slightly lower than the LTM at 5.2 times gross and 3.6 times net. On the next slide, we continue our additional disclosure, which we've had over the past few quarters, on how our central spend breaks down. Now, as you can see from the chart, total central costs have been reduced by roughly $170 million in 2019, and we have further reductions planned for 2020. Now, of the total $890 million spend in 2019, $660 million related to centralized technology and innovation activity. Roughly half of this spend relates to the companies that we have sold, but continue to supply what is called TSA revenue or Transition Services Agreement revenue. And this also includes our Dutch JV. The balance of the spend relates to our retained companies, in particular Virgin Media in Switzerland. Now, in 2020, we estimate that this total TNI spend will be around $600 million, with over $300 million of revenues being earned from the various TSA agreements. We expect this TSA-related spend to decline over the next four to five years as the contracts roll off, and the net spend of approximately $300 million to our retained operations will also decline and should be flat to down over that time frame. Much of this spend is with third parties, which makes it relatively easy to scale down, and we've recently announced additional efficiencies through a deal with Infosys, We've taken responsibility for the flexing down of this spend, further de-risking it to our shareholders. The balance of our central spend is our corporate spend, including typical corporate activities of finance, legal, HR, you know, management, etc. Following our corporate downsizing in the summer, this was reduced from $260 million in 2018 to $230 million in 2019, and we expect this to be lower still in 2020. Turning to the next page, we set out the key financial metrics for our core divisions. Now, as promised, we will now show the OCF and OFCF of all our companies after the allocation of those central T&I costs. There is further detail in our 10K and press release for those that want more detail on these allocations, but this is designed to allow our investors to compare our key divisions on an apples-to-apples basis with, for example, Belgium and our Dutch JV, who have always disclosed OCF and OFCF after their share of centralized T&I costs. As you can see, on a fully allocated OFCF basis, Belgium made $838 million of OFCF for the full year 2019, with our Dutch JV making $1.1 billion. We expect the Dutch JV over time to reach the same OFCF margin of around 30% that Belgium currently achieves as it completes the integration of its fixed and mobile operations. Switzerland made $298 million of OFCF in 2019 at a margin of around 24%. We're also targeting margin increases for Switzerland going forward as the heightened investment related to the turnaround plan is completed. Finally, the UK made just under $1.1 billion in 2019, which included an investment of $390 million in Lightning Construction CapEx. Whilst we would expect the X Lightning margin of 22% to also increase as capital intensity declines, the higher programming costs of the UK relative to the other markets as well as the fact that it rents a mobile network, not owns one, as we do in the Benelux, 
mean that the long-term OFCF margin is more likely to be in the mid to high 20% of sales rather than around that 30% mark. On the next slide, we break out the key drivers of the group's free cash flow, which remains our key focus from a financial performance point of view. Overall free cash flow was ahead of guidance at $770 million. Net interest payments were $1.1 billion in 2019, including interest income. And we would expect our interest payments to modestly decline in 2020. This is not least due to the recent refinancings of our debt. Cash tax of $358 million included a $72 million US tax payment. And we would also expect this to decline in 2020. The Dutch joint venture contributed $214 million to our free cash flow through dividends and interest on our shareholder loan. The 100 million euro shareholder loan repayment in 2019 is not included in our free cash flow definition, but means that total cash returned to us from the JB was $325 million. At our guidance FX, the Dutch JB has recently guided to $450 to $560 million of total cash available for shareholder distributions in 2020. And clearly, we would expect to receive 50% of that figure. Finally, our cash flow from working capital items, including customer cycle, vendor cycle, operational finance, restructuring, and VAT cycles, amongst others, was broadly flat, with a net investment of cash of $37 million, and we expect broadly the same pattern in 2020. So, to the last page, we set out our key guidance metrics. The key focus remains on free cash flow, and we're guiding to 30% year-on-year growth to around $1 billion. And this includes the Lightning Construction CapEx, so without that, the number will be higher. This is underpinned by a mid-single-digit increase in our OFCF, as a mid-single-digit decline in OCF is offset by further reductions in overall capital intensity. And as Mike mentioned, we continue to see value in our stock, and the board recently approved a buyback authorization of $1 billion. And with that, we're going to turn over to the operator to answer questions. One quick comment on questions. Because everybody hasn't had a chance in the past to ask questions, we're going to ask that you limit it to one question and one follow-up, if that is possible. So with that, operator, over to you. Thank you. The question and answer session will be conducted electronically. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by pressing the star or asterisk key, followed by the number one on your phone. In order to accommodate everyone, we request that you ask only one question with one clarifying follow-up, if needed. If you are using speakerphone, Please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. We'll pause for one moment to give everyone an opportunity to join the queue. And our first question comes from the line of the Jay Giant. Please go ahead. Good morning. It's uh, James Rocker for VJ. Uh, I wonder if you can go into uh, give us some more color on the expected impact of the uh, of the front book, back book, or loyalty penalty work in the UK, and both in terms of the magnitude, uh, the timing when you expect the, this impact, and any thoughts about how you're going to balance, uh, you know, potential uh, ARPU impacts versus you know potential uh, gross ad impacts in the environment. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, I'll say a couple things. I'll let uh, Lutz chime in here with uh, his thoughts. Uh, first of all, we're not providing any specific detail around that for obvious reasons. Uh, it's not really in our best interest to tell you specifically what we think we will or won't do, how we'll price things, and or what we think the impact will be, because this is obviously a competitive market. Second thing I'll say is we've already implemented the uh, program about 10 days ago, I believe, uh, in advance of the requirement to start notifications tomorrow, just to get a sense of how uh, customers are reacting and, you know, what we think the outcome will be. And uh, you know, I would say we're conservative uh, overall in our assumptions of, of the impact. Uh, there's a wide range of impacts, of course, but we're overall conservative. And I think we have a lot of tools uh, at our disposal here to ensure that the impact is minimized, but I think as it relates to almost our entire guidance and budget this year, I would say in all instances we have been conservative. Uh, Luce, you want to provide a little more color on that? Yeah. I mean, there's some public data available, of course. The broadly half of our customer base is, is out of contract, so um, 
they have the opportunity to to look for a new deal. Um, um, I think what we are doing to to simply keep them onto our network is a couple of things. So first of all, until end of March, uh, we have given all our customers so one million all together, which have a speed below 100 meg, speed upgrade free of charge. So we simply play in a different league in terms of speed, and we are leveraging that uh, to keep our customers with us. Um, as Mike said earlier on, we drive fixed mobile convergence, uh, roughly one two percent of points people who have quad play with us churn less. And then we have also uh, to offer more stuff on the content side. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, it is a change. We are definitely um, uh, informing our uh, customers uh, um, about our products. Uh, but we have also a lot to offer, and we play in the high-value segment, meaning that uh, our customers value our product and therefore also um, uh, uh, are not necessarily so price-sensitive than uh, customers in the low-end segment. Uh, we have planned carefully for, for it. We are 10 days in the market, sent out 60,000 letters, and so far, uh, uh, I think, um, impact is, is absolutely under control. By the way, the 50% uh bad book fun book it's about the same as sky so it's not that uh dissimilar from other players on the market next hey, question operator you. you thanks Shane. and our next question comes from the line of polo tang from usb or ubs please go ahead um yeah hi i've got uh, one question and uh, one clarification question um so in terms of uh 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 uh, strategic options. Uh, press reports have stated that you're in talks with Sky about both a fiber JV and a potential cable wholesale deal. If such a deal did happen, can you remind us what the merits of a deal would be from both a Liberty Global perspective but also a Sky perspective? Uh, and the clarification question is really just about guidance uh, because can you clarify what's implied for your UK and Swiss guidance because you obviously said mid single digit uh, declines for the group. Telnet's guided towards plus one percent, and you've outlined a hundred million impact from UK headwinds. So uh, does this imply, therefore, minus five percent OCF decline in the UK and high single-digit OCF declines in Switzerland? Thanks, Charlie. I'll let you uh, prepare for the guidance question on the strategic options, Polo. As I said at the uh, in my remarks, I'm not going to get into great detail about what we might or might not be doing doesn't generally serve us well. Uh, on the other hand, just speaking theoretically, you know, what would uh, a, a, a partnership with anybody, it doesn't have to be Sky, a partnership focused on driving greater reach for the Virgin network mean to us? I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, today, Virgin reaches half the country. Uh, we think we have a brand, a product, uh, you know, a capability that's underutilized and getting our network and our products to the rest of the UK market would be just by itself a very valuable outcome. Secondly, we've already shown with Lightning that there is potential to penetrate and drive returns on capital. Uh, and while we're not willing to sacrifice our free cash flow to do that on balance sheet, uh, because we believe in levered free cash flow and levered free cash flow per share, we would certainly entertain ideas or ways of achieving that off balance sheet that could accelerate the reach of one gigabit speeds and the Virgin brand, and you would expect us to do that. Uh, so there's lots of almost you know logical reasons why extending our reach, driving scale, and doing it uh, in an efficient way from a capital point of view would be hugely valuable to Virgin and to us and to you, you know, and others as shareholders. On the wholesale question, uh, trickier obviously, but if you look at Virgin today, we're only utilizing about 40% of our network. So on footprint, generally, we've got 40 plus percent of the network being utilized, which is the highest market share of anybody on our footprint. But nonetheless, there are other operators and those who don't utilize our services at all. So the question really is, uh, you know, whether you build out another 7 to 10 million homes or you look at your existing footprint, you know, should you consider monetizing the value of this one gig network, uh, there are obviously pros and cons. The pros are immediate cash flow to the bottom line that would both drive uh, expansion of the network uh, in a self-funded manner, 
um, and value creation because we know infrastructure assets trade at much higher multiples than even we're able to sell in the private market our assets. And, and then secondly, of course, um, uh, you know, the, the benefits would be, uh, well, basically that is the primary benefit. The negatives, of course, is, as I mentioned, would have to be examining the impact on your own business itself. So cannibalization and, you know, uh, what, 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 what are the negative synergies, if you will, of that? So we examine it closely. As you know, we already provide wholesale access in Belgium, something we're quite familiar with technologically, commercially. Um, no, it's not something we want to be regulated, and it won't be regulated in the UK, but it's something we ought to be looking at, uh, you know, constructively to see if there's value creation opportunities. And, and so, of course, we're, we would be doing that. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, just to say, look, we, I, I, as in the past, we're not going to give specific guidance for our retained operations. But look, as you rightly point out, mathematically, both companies, you know, will see declines. You know, the biggest issue, I think, in, in our guidance, and Mike referenced it, is this end of contract life. To be honest, I don't think any company in the UK can give you precision on what it means because it's so many variable factors. And I, I would echo Mike's comment that we've tried to be prudent in, in our guidance just to make sure we don't mislead you. Uh, later in the year, but hopefully we've been conservative. At least, uh, that's what I hope, that's, you know, if nothing else. So the other thing I would highlight is there's a big shift going on between OPEX and CAPEX. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but uh, as the world moves towards cloud services, that is a very different accounting treatment. So, for example, a cloud product is an OPEX cost, whereas if it's a data center, as it was five years ago, that's CAPEX. So some of the decline in, in uh, OCF and the increase in o OFCF is just that shift between uh, from CAPEX into OPEX. And that's one of the reasons why we're continuing to really focus our operations, our bonuses, and the way that our companies are run on the OFCF line. Because for us, that is a much better metric going forward uh, of the underlying cash flow generation. Clear. Thanks very Thanks, much. Paula. And our next question comes from the line of David Wright from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello guys, and thank you very much for, for taking the calls. Um, Mike, if, if I could just um, uh, ask you one more uh, question on the whole concept of, of building and potentially creating some kind of uh, off-balance sheet uh, venture. Uh, you've talked about, you know, having an infrastructure uh, investor alongside. I, I guess, you know, but by definition, off-balance sheet probably means this would have to be some kind of 50-50 JV or, or less from your um, side. So, you know, that would in, imply a fairly substantial infrastructure investor. Could you also consider, you know, bringing another party in, maybe, uh, uh, you know, a wholesale operator as a kind of uh, as a kind of joint partner on a venture like that? Could that be foreseeable? I think it's safe to say, David, that we're uh, examining all options. And, and you should expect us to be doing that, um, and, and that this will take time. <clears throat> Those are two points I'd make. So yes, it, it would and could make sense because obviously, uh, if you're going to build seven to ten million homes, while we believe we could penetrate effectively at the 30% level, as we seem to be doing effectively on our own Lightning ex expansion, uh, wouldn't it'll be materially better for uh, a partner? and financing if you could add additional um, operators onto that network or drive greater penetration of the network. So uh, there's, a, there's, there's puts and takes there, but clearly we would be interested in discussions not just with financial partners, but also with uh, network operators who are interested in, in the same opportunity. So I think the answer to that question is yes, we would. Uh, and I just repeat that, you know, this is, this is not happening in the first quarter. This is not stuff that's going to, you know, uh, occur overnight. This is you know, a long game that needs to be played in the market. Remember that both BT and the Altnets are virtually nowhere uh, in the marketplace. Maybe they've built as many homes as us in the aggregate, uh, but our our lightning machine at you know four or five hundred thousand homes a year is working like clockwork, with declining cost per premise and consistent uh, top line and 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 customer results. So. Even at just a half a million homes a year, we're going to keep driving uh, the growth of the, of the Virgin Network. We ought to be looking at ways of, of supercharging that, but doing it in a, in a manner that's consistent with our belief in levered free cash flow and levered free cash flow per share. And I think that's achievable. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's, it's the kind of thing we should be looking at. And we're uniquely positioned. And I'll repeat that. Virgin is probably uniquely positioned to be the one to evaluate those types of opportunities. Just another example of you know, where we sit in this UK market and why our business, we believe, is 
worth a heck of a lot more than zero. Um, <laughs> my follow-up question, if I, if I can, yeah. please, Mike, is is um, is given that you know BT is talking about ramping up. Uh, potential build, you know, by a, by a factor of two, you know, 25, 30,000 to even 50,000 a week, um, uh, you know, in 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 the kind of midterm, is the is the capacity for you guys to kind of double your build as well? Is there actual, you know, capacity of 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 the workforce required to dig roads um, to actually lay this cable? If BT is is doubling their um, build, it, it is the capacity left for you guys to do the same? We think there is, and I remember if we were to, and I'll let Lutz chime in a little bit, if we were to expand beyond the Lightning program, which is a, f a fairly targeted program where we're extending network and it's a fairly intensive construction process, uh, if we were to extend beyond that, and for example, the Liberty Networks entity we set up were to build networks similar to, say, how City Fiber is building networks that would be faster and more efficient using, you know, PAA and existing BT infrastructure. But, Lutz, why don't you comment a little bit on the current supply uh, situation in the UK on resources? Yeah, so um, I think um, we definitely get ourselves prepared to ramp up the build, right? I mean, last year we've done 505,000 5 new premises. Uh, we are leveraging PAA, um, so... Um, we are definitely understanding now uh, how to use the ducts and, and poles of open reach. So for that, we have secured also certain resources. And uh, also we have just finalized uh, a new RFP to ensure vendors, vendor partnerships for the future. And I think, um, right, we have a good uh, relationship built up over years with our vendors. And if you, if you are a vendor in UK, you want to stand on two legs instead of one. Uh, so we have met uh, really big vendors who, who only want to engage with, with one company. So therefore, um, I think, uh, yes, it is a critical resource and we, we are prepared to deal with it like that. And we have done some commitment uh, uh, to increase, uh, to make sure that we are uh, enabled for increased rollout for the next year. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. And our next question comes from the line of Nick Yall from Stockgen. Please go ahead. Yeah, morning. Just a, just a, a simple, simple one for me, please. Just on the, the buyback, Mike, on the $1 billion permission, why, why pick that number? I was just interested the number was down, obviously, versus the tender last year. The shares are, are pretty low now. Does that mean there's maybe more of a focus on M&A rather than buyback? Could you just uh, walk us through that, please? Thank you. Sure. Sure. And as I mentioned in the, my remarks, Nick, um, historically, if you were to uh, take a look at all of our buyback authorizations in the past, they have more or less been of an equal quantum. So by that, I mean, if you look at uh, generally what we've done outside of the Dutch auction tender, we've normally uh, announced at this point in time buybacks that equal roughly our free cash flow guidance and roughly, you know, 5 to 10 percent of our market cap. And so here we're at about 8% of our market cap and 100% of our free cash flow guidance. That's good discipline. That means that we're able to, you know, drive free cash flow back to shareholders. It doesn't mean that we won't do other buybacks. <clears throat> I'm not being specific about how quickly or how slowly we might put that capital to work. Uh, you know, and it, it wouldn't be a surprise to you that while we're certainly pleased and, and uh, believe that $27 a share was, uh, a smart decision on our part, and of course we have information you you know that that you would have as well. But on the other hand, we know where our strategic opportunities are, and we believe we know where value sits. So while for us twenty-seven dollars a share was certainly uh, a price we were willing to pay at twenty bucks, you know I wish we'd waited. So I think to some extent we're you know we're looking to be smart here and as to the timing of buybacks, not simply to uh, you know uh, rush into a decision knee jerk. It's not necessarily a, a buyback or M&A decision on, 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 as we look at it. We're sitting on $11 billion of liquidity, $8 billion of cash. Um, I think there's a lot of things that go into a capital allocation decisions on our part, but we think it's the right message today. It it's not, doesn't mean we won't do additional buybacks. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that we believe at this point that's the right number to allocate, and we'll get at it. Um, so there you go. 
Great. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Ben Swineberg from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, I will uh, limit myself to, I guess, one, one question around the UK. Uh, last quarter, you gave us some nice disclosure on Lightning's financials within Virgin. <laughs> There's some additional detail this quarter on their CapEx. I'm just wondering if we're at the point now where the free cash flow burn of that project has peaked or if we have kind of line of sight to when you know, that shifts from maybe a free cash flow headwind to a free cash flow tailwind in the business um, as you guys continue to scale it. Um, and then just broader on the UK, uh, for any of you, I don't know if, if now that Brexit is, I guess, largely behind us, if you're starting to see sort of the, 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 the economic headwinds to because they hit your business at the consumer or business level you know, uh, abate a bit or even reverse as we head into, you know, as we're starting here in 2020. Yeah. On the Brexit question, you know, while we did see modest uh, consumer reaction to the uncertainty and the volatility in the political process, um, you know, you should expect that, you know, we're seeing more optimism and I think the market generally is seeing more optimism in cl in the clarity of the process today. Now, it's still a moving target in terms of, you know, the final deal and all that, all those good things. Um, but I would say on balance, this is a positive for us, resolution, uh, clarity, general certainty. And, you know, we should expect and we, we intend to see hopefully a more, uh, you know, more tailwinds in that regard than headwinds. Um, Charlie, you can jump in here on the lightning financials, uh, but it's my uh, recollection looking at the specific P&Ls that we have uh, already are starting to see improvement in the negative free cash flow of that business with 120 million of EBITDA in 2019 that I believe grew around 40% year over year um, mm. from the prior year That's right. ought to be growing. Yeah, it's pretty pretty material improvements in operating free cash flow. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, but let's, let's also be clear. I mean, as Mike said, that it's a very high return. Well, we believe it's a high return project. I appreciate there are others who are concerned, but in our minds, the maths you know, stack up and the performance is, is, is supporting that. Uh, so, and you can work this out from the disclosures, we invested on an OFCF basis about $320 million in 2019. The other number we disclosed for you is the CapEx we spent on construction. But remember, we are also investing CapEx into CPE and like uh, against $1.4 billion for the core business as usual. So, you know, that's the kind of quantum. It will get less in 2020, at least on our budget numbers it will, uh, but it's still going to be a negative investment as we try and you know, continue to support this this rollout and build towards getting more scale in the market. Right, but, but that's the but point where it's improving every negative. year. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah but less right. negative. Yeah, sorry to Mike, sorry, less negative. But I mean, I'd rather not give specific yeah. guidance. But it won't be. It'll be less than three twenty. Can I make that statement? Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, Ben. And our next question comes from the line of Matthew Herring. Harrigan from Benchmark, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is one question, but it's a bit of a long question. I, I think Vodafone Digo has just been a great template for fi fixed mobile convergence, and you probably get more rational you know, pricing behavior there competitively, as well as getting the integration benefits. And presumably, with the small cell topology for 5G, that just keeps getting better and better. But how much do you think you leave on the table? On a thick MPNO with with Vodafone in in 21 versus getting everything done outright and putting the two businesses you know, together. And also, when you look at Vodafone, you know, dallying with with OpenReach and, and City Fiber and not having much of a backlog and being aggressive on broadband pricing. Is there some scenario where just beyond you know limited financial engineering or, or an outright sale, you could actually look at something in, in the UK or even Switzerland in terms of doing new JVs or, 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 or taking someone else's equity as opposed to an outright you know, cash sale today at the uh, you know, 11 time multiples, 11x multiples that we saw in, uh, in Germany, et cetera. Thanks, Matt. That was actually a very clear question, even though it was uh, long, in, as you say, but um, I'd say a couple things. Number one, on the Vodafone MDNO deal in the UK, uh, both parties had an incentive to enter into that arrangement. Uh, on their part, clearly they saw an opportunity to drive revenue to their network 
Um, and it's all incremental revenue to their network, and that's a positive for them. And so they were very aggressive and willing to be aggressive with us on, on great pricing, access to 5G. Uh, we think it saves us, I don't know, Luke, I think we've said hundreds of millions uh, in OCF over time. Um, and so that was their motivation, I believe, and I'm sure they're trying to some extent to make us happy in the in the mobile space so maybe we don't do something with somebody else we'll see i mean they weren't clear and, and we weren't discussing it with them on that basis from our point of view it was a purely an economic decision that if we're going to push fixed mobile convergence as an mbno uh in the absence of any broader transaction as you've been implying why wouldn't we do it with someone who's willing to give us access to 5g in great pricing so there was a you know i see a mutual mutual interest on both parties parts to do this uh, deal, and it's going to benefit us, obviously, materially going forward beyond 2020 when we really roll it out. In terms of uh, what, what we're quote unquote leaving on the table, you would have read, I'm sure multiple analysts have estimated what the synergies might be if uh, we were to acquire or be acquired by a mobile operator in the UK. And I, the numbers, I think, range from five to six billion pounds. NPV of Synergy, and uh, that number does not surprise me in the least since we've already been part of either as a seller, a buyer, or a merger partner in something like seven fixed mobile deals. It's one of the reasons we keep saying that this fixed mobile convergence is not just a fad. It's, it is the direction for all uh, players that we believe in these markets. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the numbers that Vodafone publicized or the numbers we publicized in Belgium or we publicized in Holland, those are not unrealistic uh, merger synergies. Um, you know, w- would we be creative on structures and and outcomes in the event of somebody was interested in either Switzerland or the UK or Poland or really any market or Ireland willing to do something with us? Of course. Why wouldn't we be creative and flexible? Uh, the goal is to create value, close the value gap, recognize the op- we know the value, recognize the value we know exists in our business. Um, we we respect the fact that for many shareholders, and as one analyst said, this is a show me moment, and you know we're cool with that. Those are the kind of situations we thrive in, and so. Um, yeah, well, I think we would be flexible. Uh, why wouldn't we be? Because I'm not being I'm not being specific about any particular transaction or market. Uh, you know, the goal is to create value, and I think as we have been in the past, we have been buyers, we have been sellers, we have been 50/50 partners. Yeah, we have we have done all three models or executed on all three models in different European markets. Clearly, we are capable of being flexible. That would be obvious. Uh, what exactly could or might happen in any of these markets, I can't predict, and I'm not going to predict for you. I'll simply say, as I said in my remarks, it's here to stay, fixed mobile convergence, whether it's through an MBNO or an MNO relationship, and, and that's a good thing for cable networks. Thanks, Mike. Yep. And our next, and our next caller is coming from the line of Sam McHugh. From Exane, please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, guys. Uh, just a quick one on the UK and TV. I guess you called out Sky's losses and yours as well. Do you think we've passed a bit of a tipping point in the UK in terms of traditional TV, or do you think you can stabilize your subscriber base again? And then maybe if you could just remind us how much gross profit you make on TV in the UK, and with the broadband market being so competitive at the moment, do you think you can offset those TV losses with broadband prices? Thanks very much. Well, I'll let Luce chime in here a little bit. I'll just simply say that um, I don't. There are very few pay TV markets uh, in the in the um, uh, you know in the first world, if you will, that aren't experiencing obviously the impact of direct to consumer streaming uh, subscriptions, as well as you know uh, I would say general cord cutting or cord shaving. You won't be able to find one, and they don't exist, and that's okay certainly has an impacted Charter or Comcast and their ability to drive valuation and growth. Um, I would say, as they have said, broadband is the business. It's the one that generates uh, essentially meaningful gross margin and is a product that you would need whether you're subscribing to our video product or any video product. Having said that, we generate gross margin, and I would say good gross margin on our video business in the UK, arguably better gross margin than the US guys. And so it's worth protecting. 
and we are doing all the things we think are necessary to protect it, including rolling out uh, our advanced uh, user interface very shortly here called Horizon 4 to replace TiVo and be available on the V6 box. That's going to, we think, be transformational to the consumer experience in the same way X1 was for Comcast. And uh, this is our basic, our version of RDK-based X1. And uh, you know, so we are investing in the user experience. We are rapidly integrating apps into the box wherever we can. We've got Amazon, we've got YouTube, we've got Netflix. We're, you know, we are open for business when it comes to ad, app integration. And that is going to make our, our platform, we think, sustainable and viable and, and even necessary for consumers who want to lean back, watch television, and get access to whatever they're interested in by simply saying to their remote control, you know, play Netflix. And so that's, that's the play. We think it will, be, will, will allow a customer to be sticky. On the other hand, as Lutz has said many times, and as we said, we're not going to chase low-end customers, and we're not going to spend capital to retain low-end customers. We're going to be smart about profitable growth, and we know that a video product combined with a broadband product and a mobile and a voice product is a much more compelling service for for customers. And so the bundle matters, and video is a big part of the bundle. So I don't see it going away. I think it's critical to us. There is gross margin. We think it can be stickier as we continue to innovate with Horizon, which we'll do this year. Uh, and as we integrate apps and become friends, even greater friends with the streamers, uh, consumers, we think, will see the benefit of leaning back, speaking into the remote, you know, play Amazon, play BBC, play ITV, um, and, and being sort of the aggregator of that content experience. To us, that's a powerful, uh, a powerful proposition, which we really haven't exploited yet in the UK market. So um, long answer. Lutz, have I missed anything or anything you want to add to that on the video side? No, I mean, I can, I only to, right? I mean, only a couple of numbers to support what you said, Mike, right? But we are, we are focusing really much more on the customer than on uh, the uh, the uh, single RGU. Um, broadly, we kept our customer base flat, and uh, we have had we have had the highest RGU increase in the market, right, in Q4. So therefore, our high value customer strategy we think pays off. Yes, we lost uh, 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 video video RGUs, as you said, um, but this is uh, uh, on the low end. And um, simply, uh, we are paying a lot of capex for the boxes, um, and the customer didn't used to pay for uh, the free TV uh, video uh, money to us. Um, and so, so we are not focusing on that anymore. And you see a, a certain operating free cash flow contribution out of that. And at the same time, we ensure that we participate in the, the OTT growth, as Mike said. And uh, the OTT growth onto our platform is 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 even higher than the video video RG you lost. So therefore, um, I think these numbers uh, are supporting exactly our strategy. Awesome, guys! Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And our next question comes from the line of Andrew Beal from RDT Research. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I guess you've got uh, eight billion in cash, and it's a pretty high proportion of your market cap, and and probably says that there's pretty limited equity value implied for Virgin Media after you've sort of taken out the other assets, assets and liabilities. So just just wondering if you can weigh up your current thinking about the relative merits of uh, various possible approaches uh, to realising value, which could be spin-offs, could be the Liberty Networks infrastructure transactions that you've been. Uh, mentioning earlier uh, your traditional approach of buybacks or M&A or anything else. Yeah, well, I'd say, look at as a base case, I mean, you're, you're correct, but, but by the way, uh, we believe that there's, you know, you can get to our stock price by pretty much ignoring Switzerland and the UK, which is, uh, you know, highly questionable in our minds, of course. Uh, but there are several ways to to get there. And I would say we begin first and foremost, with the base case business. So, uh, and as Charlie has said many times, as, as we've all repeated many times, we believe we can generate good free cash flow and free cash flow per share out of these businesses, including Virgin. And sustainable free cash flow is, in our minds, the metric that matters. Um, so as a first instance, we, we hope to be able to convince you and others that simply the free cash flow yield 
on a market like the UK is worthy of a meaningful valuation, especially if you consider Sunrise, Swisscom, even our own business, Telenet, and where those yields and multiples sit. So first and foremost, you know, this is a bit of a transformation in thinking, both for us and for investors, that we believe there is sustainable free cash flow in the business without any transactions, without any uh, inorganic moves to close the value gap that we know exists. That's, that's step one, and I think we can achieve that, and that's what we're focused on. Obviously, there are multiple things we could be doing beyond that around, uh, you know, for example, as you described, you know, monetizing our networks in a more creative way, looking at inorganic uh, combinations, whether it was mobile or other operators, um, that public listings, spinoffs. There's clearly, if there's any company out there able and capable of and willing to look at creative ways to, to shrink the value gap, you're talking to them. So you should assume that is something we are working on uh, every day and, and trying to be both you know, sensible but also creative and strategic about how we, how we, how we uh, close that value gap. Um, that's how I'd answer that question. Okay, and, and just a quick follow-up on the, the, the 7 to 10 million premises that you're talking about for the expanded UK uh, infrastructure opportunity. I mean, it's quite a big volume of, of homes and, you know, it probably means quite a bit of overbuild of others. Um, but just, can I just clarify that? Is that is that 7 to 10 beyond 2 million lightning as, as now or from the 4 million end of lightning? Uh, and is that actually yeah, what you Yeah, in our mind, it's can... 7 to 10, yeah. Good, good, good clarification. It's seven to ten from this point, principally. From this point. And you know, I, yeah. And just to be, just to add to your earlier question, certainly we could consider, you know, maybe Lightning itself is, uh, uh, you know, an asset that should be lifted and shifted, uh, and you know, be the en- and could and become the engine uh, of that growth. So I, we, I would say, it's incremental to where we are today. Okay, and and that is all your build, or is that a footprint ambition, including your build and then third-party wholesale? Uh, well, look, in, in, in general terms, we believe the opportunity exists to economically consider expanding our network to 7 to 10 million homes. Uh, the way in which you do it is to be determined, but that's what we think is an economic um, ambition. Okay. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of um, James Rasser from uh, New Street Research. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, question regarding, just kind of I suppose a follow-on really from Andrew, is just around use of capital. I mean, it seems like the message from today is that although the kind of final structure of any UK network build-out hasn't been finalized, it's clear that more capital uh, is intended to be allocated towards UK network build, but I would have thought a lot of that could also be covered uh, from your organic uh, free cash flow. Um, so it still leaves the question really of how the $8 billion of liquidity that you have um, could be used. So, I mean, I was just wondering if you can give us more thoughts on how M&A might feature in that. I mean, it's now six months since the um, Vodafone deal closed, so it'd be interesting to understand, you know, kind of what situations you've looked at. I mean, there's been stories about unit vision um, around in the press, you know, can you comment on how M&A might play a part in use of capital, um, if at all? And then just as a clarification, just regarding the £100 million of headwind in the UK, which would be around kind of 5% of Virgin's OCF, is that a headwind in addition to the 2019 trend, which was already down 2%? So we should be thinking about Virgin, all else being equal, down 7% OCF for 2020. Thank you. Um, I don't believe that's accurate in your in the 100 million, but Charlie, uh, uh, you can decide how you want to address that particular point. Uh, with respect to capital allocation, um, I think your first point is accurate. We do not intend to allocate significant 
a balance sheet capital to a build in the UK and don't believe it's necessary. So uh, a combination of free cash flow and potentially third party financing sources would be the primary uh, uh, source of capital for that. Um, that's an important clarification. Uh, while we think the opportunity is exciting and we think the need and uh, the, the ability to drive Virgin to the rest of the marketplace is exciting, I don't believe we intend to allocate significant amounts of balance sheet cash to that and don't believe we need to. It doesn't mean we won't put some cash into it. It's simply to say that you shouldn't assume we're, we're opening up you know, the spigot and pouring all that capital into UK network bill. That is not the intention. That wouldn't be consistent with our free cash flow objectives, and it's not consistent with how we would consider allocating capital. Um, doesn't mean we wouldn't put some to work, but it's not the principal uh, source of that. So that's good clarification. I would say, you know, in the a few calls ago, or maybe two calls ago, we went through the buckets of capital allocation, and, and we identified those as being first and foremost capital structure. We meaning buybacks. Well, we took. We put 3.2 billion of our capital to work in that category last year. Certainly can't be accused of not paying attention to that category or, or being serious about our investment in that category. We took another 1.6 billion and delevered. That was the second category. We did delever in the, in the Central Europe area about 1.6 billion as part of the closing of the uh, Vodafone transaction. So we certainly trimmed leverage a bit and that we thought was smart in that particular moment. The third category was core markets. That's what we've been talking about today. Core markets meaning UK, uh, Switzerland, Ireland, Belgium, Holland. And that is where we think the first and best use of cash, if it were necessary to be used, um, you know, it would be spent. And I think that is smart for us because that's where the biggest value gap exists today, uh, both in terms of apparently shareholders' minds uh, and so we want to be sure we're looking at creative and smart ways of allocating capital or perhaps even uh, generating capital in the core markets. Now, we did also say quite clearly in prior calls that we have an existing ventures portfolio. It's got a billion of value plus, we think, $2 billion unhedged. We have put you know, money to work in various uh, strategic uh, opportunities, small amounts of capital generally, and when $8 billion of cash is earning 2%, we should certainly be looking at capital solutions and, and ways of, of, of putting small amounts of money to work that could create interesting opportunities. I would say that is, that is not the main goal. It's not something that should get people nervous. Um, you know, the, the reports about us, quote, unquote, buying Univision for $9 billion were not accurate. Um, you know, but we will look creatively at deploying capital in small venture-like ways in order to drive potentially future strategic opportunity. But that is the last category on the list. It begins with capital structure, followed by leverage, followed by our core markets, uh, followed by, let's say, new markets and or ventures. And that is the order in which we're looking at it. That is the order in which we've been spending our time and effort. Um, and that's where you should want us to be spending time and effort because clearly that's where the greatest opportunity is. Um, do you want to? Was there? You want to comment on 100 million, Charlie or Luke? Yeah, you're trying to get me to give you guidance. Um, look, it's not seven percent. That's far too. <laughs> look, if you take the 100 million, it's broadly minus four. I would actually say, look, plus or minus is uh, holding the thing flat, excluding those one-offs. And at some point, you know, hopefully the British government takes its foot off its throat, and we can get back to growth. I think that's true of the industry as a whole. I think you know, there's some you know, myth about Virgin. Virgin actually, from a revenue growth, yes, it can take out lightning. It's slightly down. And maybe slide down this year with the end of contract life thing. But actually, it's performing broadly in line with many of the other markets. And if you think of the revenue decline, as largely to do with the video business, which is not a cash flow generator. I keep going back to this point about free cash flow. Yeah, it will be lost on you that the capital intensity and version of the video product is nothing like the, uh, the capital intensity of the broadband product. Uh, I think Virgin's in much better shape than people realize. And, yes, okay. thank you. Thanks, so Charles. You got it. You got it. So I think we're done, operator. We're past. We got another question? Um, we do, sir. Um, we have our last okay. question comes from the line of Robert Grindle from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Just slipped in there. Um, may I ask about um, the distribution from Vodafone Zigo in full year 20? 
Do you still expect shareholder loan repayments or can the bulk of this be in dividends? And then if I may, just a, um, a follow-up on the Project Lightning build cost. Uh, I think you flagged it went down 20% on a per home basis, but it's still over £600. Now, regardless of any new balance sheet of you know, off balance sheet vehicle to roll out more fiber, can you get the existing project lightning bill cost much closer to the city fiber level using PIA? Thank you. My answer to the second question is yes. I'll let Lutz uh, prepare a quick response to that. Charlie, you want to talk about Vodafone Zigo distributions? Uh, I mean, I think you're quite right to point out that the distributions are understated in our free cash flow number. If you'd added back the 100 million euro shareholder loan repayment to us and the 100 million euros that obviously went to Vodafone, in fact, you know, our free cash flow in uh, 2019 would actually be much higher than the 770-odd number, more like uh, 900. So yeah, it's a fair point. I think at this stage they're planning not to repay the shareholder loan. That may change. It won't be lost on either. That's, uh, that's helpful from a, from a tax planning point of view. Um, but we will see. Uh, but I think certainly in our guidance, we've factored that in, uh, and I think we've taken a relatively conservative view on distributions from, um, from Berta Benziga. I mean, on the on the lightning build cost, right? Only to make sure that we compare apples with apples. The current uh, uh, lightning costs are 618, and this is fiber to the home, right? A lot of uh, uh, costs which are disclosed by our competitors is actually fiber to the cabinet, and not really the last mile to the home is included there. So that is number one. Number two is, uh, as you said, PAA is substantially cheaper. Now, uh, um, be assured that if we are in a position to roll out uh, additional 7 to 10 million homes, we would absolutely leverage PAA. And why would we run it at a higher cost than our competitors? So therefore, you can expect uh, us to get the CPP further down leveraging PAA. Many thanks. Okay, thanks, Robert. Yep, I think that I'm guessing that's it, operator. So we appreciate everybody jumping on the call. Um, I'll just repeat what I said at the end of my remarks. We're focused on three primary things. Uh, sustainable free cash flow. We think the free cash flow story here is uh, you know, the most significant story and one that we will demonstrate over time is, is, is hopefully important to shareholders as well. Uh, secondly, closing the value gap. I think you know what that means, and you should expect that we're focused, uh, you know, very seriously on opportunities to do that uh, in core markets. And then thirdly, being disciplined about capital allocation. And uh, and you know, I think the one billion we've allocated today to to shareholder buybacks is the beginning of that. But we will and we do intend to stay very disciplined about how we allocate that capital. I think that creates a lot of opportunity for us today and down the road. So thanks for joining, and we'll speak to you soon. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes Liberty Global's fourth quarter 2019 investor call. As a reminder, a re replay of the call will be available in the investor relations section of the Liberty Global's website. There you can also find a copy of today's presentation materials. Thank you.